so I'm going to kick things off this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ken Lum and Kitty Scott in Conversation. My name is Jeffrey Little. I'm the director of Concordia University Press. Concordia University Press was founded in 2016. We're based in Montreal, which is unseen Indigenous land. The Ghani Gahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather and do our work. Uh, for the moment, I'm based in Calgary the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. In January 2020, Concordia University Press was very proud to publish Ken Lum's book, Everything is Relevant, Writings on Art and Life, 1991-2018. This is an amazingly diverse collection of Ken's writings over the past three decades, and Kitty Scott, who is with us today, uh, who is a Concordia alum and the Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the National Gallery of Canada, contributed an in introduction. I want to thank the Burks Family Foundation and Brian and Carolyn Naismith for their generous support of Concordia University Press. And I also want to recognize Concordia University and Concordia U University Library for their support. Uh, in particular, I want to thank my colleague Meredith Carruthers at Concordia University Press for her uh, fantastic work on this particular project. Everything is Relevant has been very well received and has been covered in publications like the Globe and Mail, MOMIS, Camera Austria, Canadian Art, as well as by CBC Radio's Q program. Writing in C Magazine this winter, Salem Twerty called it, quote, an inspiring and necessary anthology, which is sure to become an indispensable document. Uh, this month, the book is on sale. It's 20% off with free shipping for Canadian orders. Uh, details are on the press's website, on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts, and I'll also share the uh, uh, discount code and the URL uh, in the chat feature. You can also consult the book electronically on JSTOR and Project Muse. Uh, I'll add quickly that the book is part of the press's text context series, which is dedicated to Canadian artist writings. I'm going to say more, uh, or the press will say more in the coming weeks, uh, but I'm excited that in early 2021, we're going to publish a collection of video artist Colin Campbell's writings edited by John Davies. Uh, the collection will include video scripts, uh, lecture notes, journalistic writing, and uh, I'm very excited to say unpublic unpublished fiction by Colin Campbell. Uh, John is uh, well known to many of us. He is completing his PhD in art history at Stanford, and he's also had curatorial roles at the Art Gallery of Ontario at the Power Plant. This afternoon, I'm very grateful to Ken Lum and Kitty Scott uh, for agreeing to be with us today. Ken is based in Philadelphia, where he is the Marilyn Jordan Taylor Presidential Professor and Chair of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an officer of the Order of Canada, the recipient of the 2019 Gershon Iskwitz Prize and a 2020 Governor General's Award Laureate. Kitty, as I mentioned, is at the National Gallery of Canada, and she's also held positions at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Banff Centre, the Serpentine Galleries, and the Edmonton Art Gallery, which is now the Art Gallery of Alberta. She's curated or co-curated a number of important exhibitions, including the 2018 Liverpool Biennial. I think it's also fair to say, no exaggeration, that both Ken and Kitty have had an incredible impact on contemporary art in this country and beyond, and they've also had a very long creative and professional association. Uh, today's event, which is being recorded, is rather informal. We'll have Ken and Kitty in conversation, uh, after which we'll have time for questions, and you're very welcome to use the question and answer feature uh, in the Zoom uh, function. Uh, I'm going to fade into the background of today's event, uh, but I want to kick things off uh, by asking Kitty if she could speak as to how she approached writing her introduction to the book. Uh, as many of us know, Kitty, you co-curated a 2002-03 retrospective of Ken's photography at the National Gallery of Canada, and uh, you've obviously been familiar with his practice for many decades. Uh, I'm wondering what, uh, what you may have learned after reading uh, three decades worth of, of his critical, curatorial, uh, creative writings, and how that uh, impacted the way you think about his career and practice. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey, for the question, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, here today to speak. Um, uh, you're kind of asking me how did I approach the text, and I have to say when I was invited uh, to do this project, when you started speaking to me about it, you know, my first thought was kind of pleasure. I have to admit, I have a little bit of bias here. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I love Ken's work. You know, something that comes to mind right away is a kind of classic Ken Lum work that will never leave my head, which is uh, Molly Shum Hates Her Job, you know, a billboard on the side of Vinita uh in uh, Rotterdam. And uh, 
fantastic, fantastic work anyway. So as you said, I did this big show, so I'm quite familiar with the work. And that was at the National Gallery of Canada when I first started working there. And, you know, over time, I've developed a deep respect uh, for everything that Ken Ken does. I got to work with him again. Uh, I saw a completely different side of him, I think. Uh, you know, a little bit later in life when I was working at the Banff Centre, uh, Ken is actually talking to us from uh, Banff, Alberta now, are you, Ken? Uh, that's my <laughs> virtual background, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I invited Ken uh, to the Banff Centre to lead a master class, uh, which was in the deep, dark month of February, and he came out about uh, three times to do this, and it was a program uh, where it was the most sort of intensive program that we led, and it was positioned beside uh, the Indigenous residency that happens at the Banff Centre every February, and uh, anyway... I really got to know you much better then and uh, was really impressed with the way you handled uh, that space and time. And in my mind, it's kind of legendary. So back to the writing. Anyway, I read uh, all of Ken's texts, of course. That's the first thing I did. And I thought really deeply about what it means to be an artist who's writing, an artist like Ken Lum. And uh, from reading these texts, there was a kind of narrative arc that emerged, uh, something that I wanted to bring forward. And... I was also surprised as I was reading how much writing there was and also the depth and complexity and um, the kind of person that emerged after I read everything really, really blew me away. I thought I knew Ken, um, but I learned that there was actually a lot more that it sort of left me in time. You know, you think you know things, you go in deep and you go, actually, this is a very rich subject matter. So hello, Ken. <laughs> it's great to see you. Great to see you here. Um, I was thinking about the last time I saw you, and I think it's something that we do with uh, this kind of COVID moment. And uh, it was at the uh, memorial service for Bruce Ferguson in New York, which was probably again something like Deep Dark February, so um, maybe January even. Anyway, I hope you and your family are doing well uh, at this particular time. So I want to uh, go into my questions really for you, things I'm thinking about today with respect to this particular book, this project. And what, is it, what does it mean uh, for you to be an artist who writes? What does that mean? Um, I, don't, I don't see it as necessarily a special category. I know that a lot of people do, and I find that a little bit perplexing. For me, it was always a natural extension of all the things I do. It was just something that, you know, my, my, not, my interest led me to, so it wasn't, it wasn't like some um, uh, territory I needed to stake out to prove anything, right? I found that writing helped me to understand uh, myself better to, uh, and help me to even teach better because the terms are much more uh, lucid, much more uh, spelled out and mapped out. And uh, it made me, it just makes me a better artist. I, I'm always thinking about things and so, I saw writing as almost like uh, like diary entries, right? Uh, even even if it's an academic text I'm writing, and so all of it kind of fed feeds back into my overall thinking about art, and and I, I it serves me well in terms of um, uh, serve, uh, functioning as as references for my for myself, so I can go back into the text and go, oh right, I looked this up, and so on, so. That's why I continue to keep writing because I'm always curious and, and so on. But I don't, I don't think there's any real special status to it. I mean, I know people ascribe it to me, um, you know, but um, I don't, you know, but I think anybody could really write if you, if you really work hard at it. I mean, it's not easy writing, but I think anyone pretty well can. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of curious, when you started out, did you have any models or artists that you were looking to? Well, when I started out, it was it was during the uh, you know the last phase of uh, conceptual art, and as you know, conceptual art was was nothing if it was not a, a, a esoteric in character, intellectual in character, right? And there was this um, you know belief in in the written word, if only to deflect from representational systems, right, which were viewed as um, un, as untrustworthy. Right, and, and that the word was somehow had a kind of uh, sanctity and authority to it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the word would be something that would, would contest, uh, you know, the, the belief structure of representations. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of artists kind of gravitated towards that. They also gravitated towards traditionally non-art forms as a result, inhabiting 
uh, representational systems that were in existence in, in, in social nature uh, beyond the art system, right? And that was a way of uh, counterpointing one representational system that is the, uh, you know, ascribed to the art system and then uh, by another representational system, which is within the non-art realm. So I was always kind of interested in that kind of in intermingling. And um, so a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, artists at that time, like Dan Graham, there's Saul Witt wrote statements, uh, you know, Hans Hacke wrote, you know, uh, uh, Martha Rossler wrote, so uh, Adrian Piper, a lot of people wrote, wrote texts. I mean, I, it is true that over uh, past that point, much fewer, many, many fewer artists wrote and uh but i think it's uh it's changing again it's coming back and what about, what about other figures like uh, thomas lawson or john miller mike kelly that might be closer to you generationally were they people that you look to as well i mean well john I, john's a friend i would say and um I, I i'm in correspondence with him um I do, but i don't i mean i like i like his writings and i admire him but i don't I don't admire him any more than another artist who doesn't write, let's put it that way. I admire him because he's a smart guy and a nice guy. Mm -hmm. So nothing, you know, but still the art I think is, is the most important uh, uh, production for an artist. And were you, were you looking to literature at all back then? Was, were you reading any, any, any kind of uh, more writerly writings, if you like? Well, when, when I started in art, and I think m many people know this, you know, I was a science student and uh, I came into art so relatively late compared to a lot of people who wanted to go into art school, including many who had, um, you know, even thought, oh, I want to be an artist when I grow up. Right, which is which really surprised me when I first discovered art, and so I was, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I, I was, I thought I was a laggard, and so because I didn't know who Andy Warhol was, I didn't know a lot of things that uh, a lot of figures that pe people in the arts, art students took for granted. As a result, I felt I had to really work hard to try to even catch up, and so on, and so I read everything. I mean. I started off with primer books. I'd be reading four or five primer books at the same time. And, uh, and uh, you know, modernism, what is modern art, even, you know, basic definitions, even, you know, key words. I don't mean, mean Raymond Williams, I just mean key words. Sure. And so yeah. I was re reading a lot of things. And at some point I, I realized um, my approach was, I, I, I realized, I discovered something about myself, which is that I really like, um, maps i really like constellations and i really like constellations in the form of epistemes that weave into each other and touch each other and so on and um and so i, I would kind of fan out and uh and read parallel books you might say so on a parallel on a even a primer topic let's say i would read three or four books by different primer writers mm -hmm. yeah. modern, i'd say right and then i kind of no, you know, notice the differences between what was covered, what was not covered, and then um, I would start mapping things out. And at some point, I uh, very, very early on, I realized that in this growing map, uh, sense would emerge. Like there was a kind of logic, and there was, um, and many dots would start uh, connecting, right? And those dots can also come down, and you know, they were like nodes that kind of can break down at any point. But at the same time, there was, it's this map that's more or less, it's kind of pulsating, but it, yeah. it also I can make all these dots. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and I realized that's the way I think. I like to have, uh, I like, to have a, like a cloud full of, full of nodal points and yeah. that kind of makes sense. I'm really great at a cocktail party as a result for conversation. <laughs> I'll invite you to the next one I have. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but anyway. Um, if you're talking about these kinds of nodes and these, these kinds of maps, I would say, you know, that um, uh, at a certain moment, perhaps those nodes were race and class. I don't know if they were two nodes that actually came up or nodes were more specific uh, than something like this. But race and class, they were very important in your artwork. It kind of emerged as something uh, that developed. And I'm just curious, would you say that's true of your writing as well? Yeah, well, f well, first of all, I would say that uh, race and class was was the natural perspective I had. It wasn't like something I was maybe even that conscious of. I mean, uh, other than when I was younger, really wanting to 
break out of my class. I, I knew that. I didn't want to be working class, you know, and so on. So it was like, and that was slightly intuitive too. It wasn't only because, you know, it looked greener on the other side. Let's put that way. If you're in the, another class, it's just look, look more pleasant and, and, and so on. So I knew, I, and that was instilled in me by my, my mother, you know, to work really hard mm -hmm. and um, get a good job and, and, you know, the value of education and, and so on. So, so when I first started making art, I thought it was also part of the license of conceptual art, right? Because they were, it was, it was about quotidian subjects, all kinds of subjects that were, you know, even verboten because they weren't seen as uh, maybe serious enough, elevated enough to constitute uh, as, uh, as proper subject matter for contemporary art, right? And, but I felt there was license. I felt there was license for someone of my background, my skin color, my class, background to enter into it right I mean I soon discovered that that was uh, while that wasn't entirely uh, untrue it also wasn't entirely true either there was there was a lot of let's just say the, the rhetoric was loftier than the reality mm -hmm. right so and uh, I mean I made I, I made work and when I started first making uh, work like moments Okay, I'm. I'm just kind of curious. So, in that in that um, uh, description or how you play this kind of question out, come back to the writing with me and and talk about this kind of same issue within the writing. It it functions differently somehow, right? It it doesn't function in the same way. Yeah. Well, uh, well, you have to. Writing requires you to be able to uh, write convincingly too, right? It's like a. It has a different. Um, you know, rules, you might say, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have prom <laughs> you have to have a proper sentence structure for one thing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have a, a train of thought. You have to develop an argument, mm -hmm. right? Or many words, mm -hmm. right? And so that requires a certain, um, you know, intense practice to, right? Which, and, and, um, and it's totally different from, from art, right? But I, but it isn't it isn't different in the sense that um, it's it's still an expression of my own um, subject position in the world as I look at uh, all kinds of issues, including what you're alluding to, uh, inequity and, and social justice issues, which has always been a part of my my work. Right? I I don't I don't think I'm an artist that is can be characterized as as an, as an explicit advocate or an agent of, of um, you know, uh, a, a kind of a, a, what the French would call an artiste engagé. Mm -hmm. I don't think I, I'm quite that, but, but I do think my work is, is rooted in, you know, these tensions, of, uh, social tensions between class and so on. But it's, for me, it's not even the question of class, although that, that is important. It's, to me, it's the question of, um, of uh, you know, the, the the borders of expression, uh, what we, you know, it sounds totally cliche to say the, the way humans treat another human being, right? I think all those types of things are really important for, for art. And so it, kind of connecting those relations, if you like, how one person treats another human being, how one person thinks about another human being. Um, when reading your text, you know, I would say that uh, uh, some of them are kind of very journalistic in nature, some are more critical, some are very biographical, others seem, writ others seem written for professors or students. And of course, this is partly due to who's asking you to write, where these things are being published. But I'm curious, how much, how much do you think about the reader of your writing? Well, I th uh, well, if I was if I was smarter, I would have probably been much more calculating in terms of, um, you know, anticipating um, the, the readership in the sense that it would, in the sense that my own writings would be a justification of my own artistic position, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and it would furnish uh, critics and people who are interested sure. the very the very language, even the the, the template mm -hmm. for uh, others to describe my work. Right, mm -hmm. uh, but I was I wasn't smart enough to do that. My mind is a very I tend to wander a lot. I, I'm wa I wander in terms of interest. I would say I, I have a very kind of restless kind of mind, and so 
I'm interested in, in many, many things, right? And I, I guess I've also, to a degree, in my own worst enemy, I, I say it slightly cheekily, in the sense that I just, I, it never interested me to just write, to stake out my own position as an artist in the art world. I was much more interested in um, just, you know, whatever forms it took to convey the totality of what I was interested in and what I wanted to say. Yeah, so that, that notion of wandering is is really nice. It kind of uh, one of the things I've been thinking about as um, uh, preparing uh, my thoughts for today is that you know you uh, in reading the text and looking at everything that you you've written, um, what becomes visible is you sort of in, in 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 writing all these things you sort of emerge as a global citizen and you know you're an artist if you like who starts out in Vancouver uh, writing from there. Um, and as you continue to write, you, uh, a picture becomes really visible of, of you as this kind of global art world citizen. And I'm wondering if you can tell me what role writing played in that transformation. Well, um, I, I, writing, uh, especially in the 90s, I would say, when I was really traveling a lot more than I do now. I've got kids, but of course, right now I can't travel a lot because of the pandemic. But um, Writing to me was a way of, as I mentioned earlier, just kind of um, formalizing thoughts at any given moment I was having about something. I was, uh, my curiosity was always extending into wherever I was, uh, on, on, I would say on a very deep level, you know, and, uh, and I couldn't get enough of trying to figure out why, why something was the way it was or why something wasn't, wasn't better than it was. And so I found um, writing very useful for that. So, for example, when I was in uh, teaching in Martinique mm -hmm. at the Fort de France, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, just this, it, the writing came out of the fact that the students there had this um, aspiration to visit Paris, right, constantly. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, what about other places? And they said, no, we want to go to Paris first. And I I, I saw that as a kind of uh, a result of the highly colon, uh, the, uh, colonized relationship of Guadeloupe and Martinique to France, right? But at the same time, that answer uh, called to mind uh, a great uh, West African film from, I think, 1973 called Tuki Buki, where, you know, the, the protagonists were also aspiring to go to France because it was, uh, you know, set in post-colonial Senegal, right? And so on. So that's what I mean by these kinds of... Um, uh, these kinds of uh, you know points in a map that join up. The students from Martinique said something. I it uh, conjured up for me Tuki Buki from West Africa, and that was another point. And it was about um, Paris. And so I started studying, uh, for example, in that case, the history of France in West Africa. I read. I, in fact, I taught a whole course at Penn about that you know, that delves into de Gaulle's uh, final tours in 19, from 58 to 1960 to plead with uh, West African countries to stay within the French bosom and what that meant. And, uh, and also what, what it meant for, you know, colonized, decolonized countries um, uh, to, uh, from, 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 from France and, uh, and, and the whole issue of like, um, you know, the song Gore, Song Gore debate about um, you know uh, Pan Africanism and so on. So writing that resulted in a whole bunch of lectures I, I wrote, but I, they weren't. I, I suppose I could could have converted them into uh, publishable essays, right? So, but that's that's how I I write. A lot of times I I write like that, and in that case, that led me to be invited to be project manager for, manager for the short century, right? Because of my because I had proof uh, to Okui that I, I had. I had uh, interest in this area. It wasn't like just something, hey, I'd be interested in doing that and so on. So I find that when you write and, or when you, you have, to, you have to be curious and you have to show people that you're, 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 you're willing to do the work of writing to, to demonstrate your interest in something and, and projects open up for you. You know, you really um, kind of found your stride there. It seemed like you were involved with everyone and everything that was going on. You were 
Uh, you wrote for Cities on the Move, uh, the big exhibition that Hugh Henry did that traveled around. Uh, you know, the short century, as you mentioned, with Okwi and Bizor, uh, the great uh, curator, one of the great curators that has recently passed away. Um, so yeah, you really found, and Charger, what you did there with the Biennale, you really found yourself sort of inserted in the art world. So it's a, a big, big thing that happened. Um, they were always surprising, like Sharjah, uh, when I was invited to Sharjah to co-curate, I was totally shocked, right? Uh, so it wasn't like something I even, I even sought out. It was just someone said, oh, I, I read some text by you, and, and uh, I, I, I had Jack Prosecchi, and he's chief curator, and he said, and I thought, and I didn't even know him at that point, and he said, I'm just looking for an artist who, who you know, has a kind of curiosity, openness to different regions of the world, and and I thought about you, so. It's nice, so the writing in a way pulled you there along with the work, the work in the yeah. writing pulled you yeah. there. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, so one of the things connected uh, to this moment in time as well is that you uh, spent an awful lot of time in China and you ended up writing quite a bit about Chinese work, uh, Chinese art and your relationship with Chinese artists and such. In, in all of that, were you seeking out something or, uh, was there something that you learned in the process of doing that? Well, I mean, China has a special place in me because I'm ethnically Chinese, right? When I grew up, uh, I didn't I didn't speak English until I was, I was uh, six years old, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, went, I didn't go to kindergarten. And when I, my first class in grade one, uh, this is a true story in Vancouver, I had no idea what these white faces were saying to me. I didn't understand what they were saying. It was very traumatic. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I always grew up with, you know, my, my grandfather who's long passed away telling me, you know, you, you know, don't forget you're Chinese and it doesn't matter if you're, you hold a Canadian passport and so on. So it had this kind of a imagining for me. Uh, when I first went to China in the uh, 84, mm -hmm. right, I guess, and uh, I, I discovered something. I discovered that I was really far from <laughs> the people there. Right. And uh, I mean, I, I saw people that looked like me, which was, you know, it was, it was kind of uh, endless, kind of uncanny encounters because if you go back to the same area as your family comes from. And a lot of people are going to look like you. Right. And so same build, same you know, and so on. And uh, and I like I, I love Cantonese food. So there are a lot of things I understood. I, I one, one thing I did learn was. And I guess I never appreciated it uh, to the degree I, I should have. Well, is just how Chinese my, my mother was. You know, I, I, that was something that really surprised me when I went there. A lot of things she did, she did a lot of Buddhist rituals, a lot of different things, and, um, and I never f really understood it, right? It was, it was, and uh, then when I went to China for the first time, I, I did understand it. So I learned a lot about it. I also learned, um, and, and uh, I didn't have any plans for it, right? I just thought it was, I was, it was during a moment when I was very interested in knowing uh, more about more about the world. I was a little bit disillusioned. I've written about that in my book uh, with the art world, the way it was, at least for me. And um, so when I met people that knew a lot about China or came from China and were interested in art of China, I basically said, I want to insinuate myself uh, in that in, in any way I can. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so um, connected to that, you, you wrote these London Art Diaries, and I remember when they came out, they were on the internet, and it was, I think, a very early example of somebody writing quite seriously on the internet, and they kind of disappeared, I think, quite quickly as well. Um, uh, they had a kind of a feel of an almost sort of arts journalism, if I were to kind of give them a, a genre, if you like, and I, I'm curious... Uh, do you do you think about Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook as being interesting place for artists to write right now? Well, it's funny you say that because um, my uh, Los Angeles gallery mm -hmm. said, "Well, since you're not interested in social media, we're going to going to start an Instagram page for you, right?" And uh, and this is, I think, barely three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Then and." We'll get, you can come into it if you want, right? But we're just going to keep posting your work and so on Instagram because it's, because uh, on um, there's a hash mark with my name on it, you know, which I didn't set up. And there's like about two thousand postings, right. on it, right? 
And so the and so they said, well, so but we'll give you the, the the password and so on. We'll set it up, right? And um, anyways, I, I like it. <laughs> so I, I'd be posting not 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 very much. I had to ask them what the difference between a follower and following was. Or fo I can't remember is it following or follower? I can't, something like that. And so I didn't know how how it worked. I didn't know how to post an image, and it was a totally new experience for me. I, I certainly. And since then, I've seen um, like there's been several uh, people who I like very much in, in who's who I've since become reacquainted with, right? Okay. Nice. Which is right. And then um, also I, I have a new um, you might say a new pen pal in uh, Yves Alain Bois, the French <laughs> French writer who, who's whole north of Princeton, right? So I've been writing with him. Uh, of late, uh, but, and that was only that was purely because of Instagram. So I'm, I've kind of uh, surrendered to the dark side, you might say, and being much more open, at least to Instagram. I'm not on uh, Facebook or anything like that. No, but didn't didn't Melly Shum? In fact, didn't Melly Shum have a Facebook page at one point? Melly Shum may have had a Facebook page, but I didn't start it. I okay. think some other people started it. And there was a, what's what's the old picture one? There used to be a, not Pinterest, but there used to be a. Uh, uh, a, a picture flicker right there was like li literally five six hundred melishon pictures on flicker right? right but those were start started by you know melishon groupies or something <laughs> that had nothing to do with me yeah so to, to, to kind of change track I do, have, I do have an instagram page and it's ken D double underline lum so anybody wants to Follow me, please. I'm, old, I'm I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear. Um, so we know we know a little bit about what you're what you're writing. Um, who you're writing to, maybe, is a better a better way of saying it. But I'm kind of curious. Um, what are you reading now? Well, recently um, I had a correspondence with uh, Barry Schwabsky, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, who you know, you I think he writes for the Nation and uh, sometimes the Art Forum and so on and. Um, and a super nice guy, I discovered. And uh, so uh, he sent me his book on contemporary painting, and I, I've been reading s several of his essays. It's basically an anthology of his, his sh uh, essays, some of them shorter, some of them longer. And uh, I mean, I have to say, it's deeply pleasurable. He's got a very, he has an incredible facility for, you know, a kind of observation, particularly about painting, right? It's not something I can do. With, with these at all, but it, but I, I admire someone who is so committed and and, and has a very deep uh, acumen for mm -hmm. for writing about things and and I think uh, and it's affected me right in in the sense that um I I I, I kind of started to build up my uh, appreciation again for for painterly language mm -hmm. and so on, which I think is is actually really interesting to have, especially if it's developed in a in a very deep way. So that's, that's one book. I've been reading a lot of books on, I read a lot of books um, that, uh, are that are required uh, for teaching of a class. Mm -hmm. I teach a lot of, um, I, I, I invent a lot of special types of classes. So the class I, I taught in the spring was called the Chinese Body and Spatial Production in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Very popular course, very timely, <laughs> a timely course about anti-Sino uh, sentiment in the 19th century and uh, of various Chinese enclaves and or Chinese and other enclaves, such as starting in Limehouse and and um, the disaster of the USS Waverly ship, where three hundred uh, Chinese uh, were asphyxiated before they even uh, got off in Lima, right? And so uh, I'm reading. Uh, I read a lot uh, of books uh, like that. It was just you know because I was curious about the topic and. Um, and one book, uh, and but, but even uh, within that, you, you, I discover a book. So like one's called the Chinatown um, Trunk Mystery, and I thought, okay, it has this one section I, uh, you know, that seems kind of interesting. So I bought it on Amazon. It turned out to be a terrific book. Right, a lot of maps about where chop suey restaurants were open, always near subway lines. This is in the 19th century. Uh, all kinds of things that I just found really, really interesting. The kind of surveillance of uh, pigtail Chinese men throughout Manhattan in particular, and, and, uh, and also the various kinds of imaginings of, you know, the kind of, um, you know, nefarious imaginings of, of yeah. their conduct and, 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 and so on. So 
yeah, I, I don't really have any real um, meth method in terms of what I read. I just, I read a lot of different things. I'm, I'm, I'm a real big news junkie. I, I mean, I read, I still read, I still subscribe to things like, you know, like this. Oh, can you see it? Oh, oh. <laughs> Harper's Magazine, okay? You know, Harper's. So, I, you know, nobody, nobody subscribes to magazines, but I, I like subscribing to certain types of magazines. Okay. So I, 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 and, uh, I have Washington Post, um, you know, uh, New York Times apps and local mail apps. So kind of curious, two last questions and then we, we can wrap it up. I'm, I'm sort of uh, listening to everything you're saying and uh, one of the things that was uh, going on in my mind is just a little bit, uh, not necessarily a topic we need to delve into now, but what's going to happen to Chinatown in relationship to COVID and you know, how will, how will this present time affect Chinatowns across the world? I mean, I don't, I don't know what the answer is there, but you think about, you know, all the restaurants that happen to be in those places and what's happening in the restaurant industry, et cetera. I know there's lots of takeout and there's always been Chinese takeout. Um, so that's, that's a good thing, but uh, I'm kind of curious. That's a big question anyway. Um, but I guess the, the questions that I wanted to finish with um, are essentially, what, what are you writing about now? What are you thinking about now? And what are those writing projects that you have yet to write, but they're kind of, they're out there and you haven't quite grasped them yet, but you wanna, you wanna get to them at some point? I'm always asked to write, I was asked to write a, a keynote speech, you know, until the pandemic interrupted it. Um, I was supposed to give it for a, a public art conference in Canada, uh, you know, in, uh, in Toronto, okay. right? Um, and then I thought, okay, I'll write that. I mean, I, I actually said no twice, and then they came back and they kept saying, can you put in so I'm like, fine, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> so I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say this publicly because uh, uh, that um, whenever people ask me repeatedly, I basically end up saying yes. That's right? good to know. That's good to know. I'll remember that. I'll remember that. <laughs> I should have left that out of the bag. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's something uh, I'm working on. Um, you know, City of Munich. Uh, asked me to write something, um, you know, uh, uh, for, um, you know, this uh, uh, show by the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Documentation Center for National Socialism, right? And um, so they want, you know, me to write something about how does, how does the mandate of this Documentation Center, what is its relationship to, to today when you've got populist, so-called populist, uh, uh, you know, uh, leaders uh, reemerging and and so on. So, and then I thought that sounds kind of interesting. And yeah, I think I'll, I have. If I if I've given something any thought, then I I tend to be more interested in saying yes. I'll, mm -hmm. uh, I'll I'll write it. So those are two two things I'm writing about. I don't I don't kind of think about well, what's the gap that it's not like a record album collection. You know, I'm missing this gap sure. and so on. So. Sure. And any project I, I, there's a side of me that I actually don't want to write anymore. I'm, I'm tired of writing because, it, because in my regular job at Penn, I'm writing so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the lectures I write probably could fill several books. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there, there, there's, there's no volume one and two and three? Uh, no. No. <laughs> okay. Well, never, never say never, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. That's the that's the end of my question. So thank you so much, Ken. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. This is this has been really fantastic. Uh, invite uh, participants out in Zoom land to use the uh, question and answer uh, function in Zoom, uh, and we'll take we'll take questions that way. Uh, Ken, I'm I'm curious in terms of I've got a question for you actually. So you you write really movingly in your in your in the, your preface to the book about uh, two women who. Uh, in addition to your mother, who, who shaped who you were when you were young, and one is Pearl Gould, uh, and the other is, is Marianna Schmidt. And, and both sound uh, like absolutely amazing women who had, had a really strong impact on you at two different points in your life, but when you were still relatively young. And I'm wondering if you could say more about these two, two, these two really powerful figures. Well, I, I think I was... Uh... I was lucky because I, I, I truly believe that if, if I didn't have people like that at certain moments in my life, and those two are obviously outstanding examples, then, then I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am or I'd be at a different spot, let's say, you know, and, uh, and that requires someone to be, uh, really be engaged with you, right, and, and, uh, and so on. So the first one is, is in a way more meaningful because I, I, was, I didn't really 
well, I wasn't doing very well in school. I mean, we're talking about grade grade three, I guess. I was doing very poorly in school right up until that point, and uh, and she kind of introduced me to the to the white world, you might say, right? She 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 took my brother and I in after school. We otherwise we would have just been watching TV for a couple hours, right? And so until my mother came home from work, and then she, uh, and she uh, you know gave us lessons how to write a sentence, you know, uh, you know, paragraphs, uh, basic little stories, uh, fairy tales, all kinds of things. I didn't, I didn't know any of that stuff. Even, even um, as I, I, I mentioned in my essay, you know, introducing me to, uh, you know, cream of mushroom soup and chicken noodle soup, right? I didn't, I didn't have any of that, a cheese sandwich. I, I really felt that all those uh, moments represented for me a kind of uh, entering into the world, right? The dominant world you might say, right? Or the dom the world that was dominating me, but nonetheless, it was important for, for me and it opened up uh, horizons for me. And Mariana was uh, someone who, I, I, I was fresh into art at that point. And here she was, she was quite aged when I met her and she um, was inspiring. She just couldn't get enough. And I, and I was just f fascinated by, this uh, person who, whenever I went to the Vancouver Art Gallery Library, there she was, sitting there and just reading through things voraciously. She started talking to me, and and, and we started just having the most uh, marvelous conversations about art and uh, the art world. And, and she was uh, just uh, uh, she was uh, she became a model for me. Thanks very much. Uh, David Schaefer has a question. Uh, is there anything that you could say or comment on regarding your furniture installations? Have you written about those projects and that kind of work? Well, I've, I've written about them, but not very much. Like usually about a page where I uh, answer some uh, Q&A uh, type questions in an in interview form. I mean, the funny thing about the furniture work is that um, nobody was interested in, I mean, Kitty can tell you, that nobody was interested in that stuff for a long time. I'm, I'm not talking about like year, a few years, I'm talking about decades. No one was interested in it. Right? Or people were interested, but they didn't, they didn't quite know how to put words to it. They didn't quite know how to wrap it, right? And, and I think that was actually its, its strength, that it could elude kind of a, a kind of formalized language for such a long time, right? Elude, elude a kind of acculturated language. Um, but now it's like everyone, Wants. There's a major museum in New York. Um, until the COVID <laughs> moment arrived, they, you know, hopefully they're still <laughs> interested. They want to buy one, right? And so, um, yeah. But when I first did it, people would say, you know, this is just a kind of wiseacre young artist, you know, making work. That's okay. It's got some visual wit to it, but uh, that was about it. It was quite discounted quite quickly. He said, oh yeah, I found it cute, and, but uh, it wasn't very serious. I mean, that was the, that was the general consensus about any, all, all that work. A uh, question from Tom McDonough. Uh, hi, Kitty and Ken, congrats on the beautiful book. Uh, and he wonders about the photo on the cover, uh, which uh, he says he thinks it's by you. In fact, it is by you, Ken, and it's uh, Père Lachaise, exactement. Um, wondering if you could talk about, about that photo. Well, I, I thought it was a bit. It would be funny because it's a it's a, 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 a the subtitle of the book is writings on art and life, and I thought you know, life is also about uh, you know its end point, death as well, right? And uh, and uh, I was uh, not long ago in Paris at, uh, when the subject of the cover came up, and I had this picture of Père Lachaise, and 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 I went there because it was part of a pen class. And I was glad too because um, I probably wouldn't have gone there <laughs> because I, I it's one of those things where you know it's like going to New York yeah I've been up to the Empire State Building so I don't need to go back up there and so I, I went to Paris and these students said oh uh, we'd like to go to Père Lachaise and I went oh okay um, sure <laughs> during the break and I was so glad I did right and uh, you know to kind of see uh, you know Oscar Wilde and uh, you know Jericho and uh, you know all 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 these kind of great great figures um, of, um, you know, all these great artists and, and, and so on. And uh, they're still alive in a way, right? It kind of revivifies them. And so, yeah. And I also like the idea of a journey, 
you know, that this is a pathway, like Robert Frank's Endless Highway, right? Except it's a, it's a, it's a pedestrian corridor of a, of a, of a cemetery. Well, I remember, Ken, I think you'll, you'll remember this as well, but we, when we started talking about the cover, uh, there, were, there were some other really interesting photos. I don't have them at hand, but there was a photo of a, a, a minivan that had crashed into uh, a, Pens- uh, a Philadelphia street corner. Right. Uh, there was one... Um, I don't want to be too much like J.G. Ballard. That's the... <laughs> and there like was a, a, <laughs> the sexual desire of a car crash, you know, things like that. And there was also that uh, really interesting photo of uh, like a, a water outlet where, where ice had frozen and so it looked like a scary kind of face. I mean, they were all really, really yeah. excellent. excellent. The, neon, the void, yeah. A uh, question uh, from uh, Gabby Moser. Hi, Kitty and Ken. Thanks for the wonderful conversation. Ken, could you say a bit about how uh, your, you understand writing in your works, the billboards, the strip mall signs versus writing alongside your works? like essays and memoirs? Well, they're, they're two different. Uh, well, first of all, you, you need a different mindset for, for each. Obviously, uh, writing a, a kind of a short caption for that's part of, of a visual work is, you know, requires not as much uh, time or you know, commitment, right? I mean, I can kind of play with the words and so on, but there's only so many words. But if you're writing a 5,000 word essay or longer, you know, that takes months to write, right? You need, and you have to write it according to a certain style. You need to uh, have citations. You need to keep your reference points, all kinds of things like that. So it's much, much more involving. But having said that, as I mentioned uh, in my conversation with Kitty earlier, they do intertwine, right? I, I see them bleeding into each other in terms of, in terms of my, my interests. I don't, I don't see writing as necessarily an extension of my artistic practice, but I do see writing as, as something that, it, that I, as an artist, do. And I think that's, that's, that there's a uh, delineation between you know, uh, an extension of artistic practice, which I know a lot of artists see writing or teaching as part of their extension, as an extension of their artistic practice, but I don't. I don't see teaching as an extension of my artistic practice. I see teaching as an extension of my need to make money to survive and so on. So, you know. Uh, so Mark Klintberg has uh, a question for uh, Kitty um, uh, around um, uh, bringing Ken to Banff when you were at the Banff Center and uh, uh, why you, uh, what, what prompted you to invite him and, and uh, what did you see happen uh, when he was at, at the center? Yeah, no, I, I guess uh, coming into the center, I wanted to have a kind of strand in the program there that was more, uh, what I would say, more, I'm just going to say academic in a way, somehow more focused, um, less about learning by oneself about oneself, perhaps. And um, someone, I wanted to bring someone in who would sort of, I'm, I'm just going to use this very basic language, would sort of truly test people in a way. And somebody who was worldly, that was very important, somebody who was worldly. And um, I'm not sure how exactly how I landed on Ken. I don't remember that. It's possible that I had met him somewhere, you know, through travels and such, and it just kind of stuck. But he's He's somebody who I have deep respect for uh, as a thinker, as an artist. Uh, he's a great teacher. And obviously I had a number of conversations. He may remember those much better than I. I don't actually remember when I came to him and what that moment was. Uh, it's, not, it's not etched in my memory, unfortunately. But uh, when he came to Banff, one of the things... One of the things that was also going on in Banff at that particular time was uh, it's February. It's an actual kind of difficult time to bring people to Banff. It's, as I said, cold and dark. And I was also looking for a way to kind of, if you like, brighten brighten that moment. And there was also a indigenous indigenous residency that the the Banff Centre had organized previous to my coming. And when I arrived at the centre, I thought this indigenous residency, I kind of looked at it and I thought, this is kind of strange. There's this indigenous residency. Why wouldn't indigenous artists come all through the year? 
why do we have this kind of one pocket? And I thought that I would, and, and I will say that all the Indigenous artists were given full funding, they were fully supported. It, it, it's an amazing program, no doubt. But what I thought is why can't we take that funding and spread it across the year and Indigenous artists can come at any time. And um, I talked to a few Indigenous artists at that time and they told me, no, we want to, we want to keep this program. It's, it's sacred. It's important. It's one of the few places uh, in Canada where we can all get together and meet one another. So I thought, okay, I'm going to keep that completely intact. Um, but what can I bring in alongside it that will open up that space so that there will be um, something else going on that is, that is kind of worldly in a way and not, you know, focused on, uh, Banff and that particular place and coming together with a certain group of people and um, I, I think I very early on told Ken about this situation as well and I think I asked him, I feel like that, that was key here, that if any of those artists wish to attend his program or be involved in his program uh, that he would, he would also accept that uh, it's possible that it happened more organically but uh, one of the things I really liked about Ken was his approach to the center. I think he fully understood the center and he used every moment of an artist's time there as a kind of space of learning. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to hand this over to you, Ken, to say if you was, because I think you'll have a different impression. But I think Ken, Ken is interested in sort of forming cosmopolitan artists, artists who have a sense of the world. And he, you know, he, there's a kind of learning that can take place over dinner. Uh, he talked earlier on about, um, you know, having, was it a grilled cheese sandwich and, and, uh, and whatever with the woman who lived down the street or that early kind of mentor that you had, if you like. Um, but that moment at dinner is a space to learn. Uh, film nights are very, very social. Ken uh, also hosted uh, dinners for the artist. I have to say he was uh, more involved with the artists who were, in the program than any other person who came and uh, Ken was a master. So Ken, I'm give it to you to say a few words. Well, I mean, I, I know at Penn, the, the uh, students either like me or not like me because they, they, they say, and I, I don't know whether it's a compliment or not a compliment, but they, they, they say to one another that I'm, I'm very old school in the way I teach because I, I require a whiteboard and, uh, you know, and I have a, 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 a you know, a, a brush and, um, and I, I sit down and I have notations and I have people, I make sure that people read the text and, and, and so on, right? And uh, it's, not, it's not an act, it's just the way, I don't know how else to teach. I'm not a very creative teacher that way. And so I, I, that's what I, I told Kitty when she invited me, I said, I'm going to be teaching it that way, right? And, uh, and um, I, I think th there was probably some risk I in that in terms of whether it would, it would work, uh, uh, given given the situation, and uh, I think it did right over. And especially after the first one was successful, the next two were were much more uh, easy. And uh, I, I see Brenda Draney is also um, among the participants watching this right now. She was up there, and uh, there was a lot of um, intersection with the uh, First Nations uh, artists there. And my sense was that uh, they were they functioned parallel to one another without ever really meeting each other in previous uh, previous occasions uh, to my arrival there. I'm not sure. That was just my sense because some of them, many of the uh, First Nations artists were had uh, had gone there several times before, right? And they basically said that to me. I never really met any of the other people, all right? And so they, I invited them to sit in, in my class, and they became. You know, we were all playing badminton together, playing billiards together. There was a film night together. And it was, it was by the way, film night was, as you remember, Kitty, it wasn't just any film night. It was very serious films. It was right? very serious. It was like Peter Pinchali, uh, early Werner Herzog. I give a background in terms of why this film is important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mizuguchi, you know, kind of a, a great, great films. T. Lai, you know, from uh, Burkina Faso. Got a lot of great great films uh, and in but why because they're relevant today to 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 what was going on at that moment to in in the art world as well i think you actually gave tests as well which i don't think any other any anyone else who i invited to Banff actually uh, carried out tests yeah i gave i give i still give tests <laughs> <laughs> so, so walter dion says that uh, february is the best time to go to Banff. And a uh, question from Carrie Swinar. 
Uh, Ken, I really appreciated your writings in the book on public art and on Monument Lab. It can be tough to find critical writings on uh, art in the public realm. Can you speak a little about your interest in working with public art and how that has evolved throughout your career? Sure. I would say that um, all, you know, since the very beginning, I guess my art always had a public character. And I, I've been thinking about this question, why it ha has ha long had a public character. And I think it's just because, partly because of my upbringing. We lived not in the biggest circumstances in terms of interior spaces they were quite small and uh everyone you know, basically the only life you had in a way was um was out in the street right so um i mean that seriously like if you're middle class you've got a even a 2000 square foot home just think about how much more time you're spending at home as opposed to a much tinier abode right and so and also because you know i was always in part-time jobs right so i was always outside and so all, all my formation, you might say, would be in, in the streets, in, in, in you know, various neighborhoods, as opposed to um, more interior spaces or, or, or even the spaces of institutions like, like schools or whatever, or museums, right? Because they weren't so open to me at that point. I didn't even know about them. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I started. Uh, that's how I started. Um, um, thinking about um, art uh, and I would say that for a long time a lot of people said well why don't you make public art because I didn't make public art until really about 2000 and um, and I'd already been an artist for about 20 years at that point and uh, and I said no I, I, I don't need to make public art my uh, you know uh, I think the the audience is heterogeneous when you go into a, a museum that's actually not correct right I think it's like you can't predict an audience, but one thing you can predict is that anyone who walks into a museum will not have any problems recognizing the purpose of the museum. That is the part, right? And so it, um, the public character of my, my work uh, was destined for museums. And then at some point, uh, I guess it was after 89 actually with uh, Melly Shum, because I, that went up and then um, there was a, uh, an uproar when the museum took it down after the show. It was just purely uh, to advertise the show. And then when there was a public uproar to um, to reinstall the piece, I was totally surprised by it, right? Because people said, you know, when, when they asked, I've said the story many times, when, when people asked, like, why, why, when the museum asked why the, 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 the billboard needs, needed to go back up, the number one reason was we all need a monument to people who hate their jobs, right? Which is sounds, it's funny, right? But I remember thinking, wow, okay. But I, 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 and also I appreciated how the work didn't belong to me anymore. It kind of entered into the public realm. And, and so I was very curious about entering uh, more into it. And, and of course, anyone uh, who works in public art knows that there are many different rules. You have to, you can't, you can't be confident in terms of the, your audience because it's a public, right? It's much wider, right? Uh, e even on the level, of, uh, you know, at the work declaring itself as a work of art is not readily apparent when, in, in a public context. So there's lots of things I've learned uh, making public art, although right now, and so as a consequence, I, and this goes back to what I said earlier to Kitty in terms of my interest in forming constellations, I was interested in public space, how public space is, produced from Henri Lefebvre to, you know, the Chicago school of the 1920s and, um, you know, even extending to redlining by insurers and, uh, and the way of visualizing geography or, or even ideas of like La, La Terran Vague by Saskia Sassen. So I was always interested in these questions of space, uh, which came out of my interest in public art, right? So, and, uh, uh, but now I'm, I want to get back into making work for galleries. At the same time, Ken, uh, as you talk about all that, you know, there is in the work itself, this sense of speaking to a public and a use of kind of signage, you know, the, uh, what are the, the, I can't remember the name of them, the, where you use those signs, you know, the lawyers closed, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're using these signs that come Not from, 
Yeah. yeah, from the external world and then the series that are using the strip mall signage. So there's always this play, it seems, and then the actual use of language. You almost speak to your viewer directly at times. In yeah, the I'm very interested in, 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 in this kind of moment uh, of uh, maybe uh, uncertainty in terms of, um, th is this a work of art or is this uh, not a work of art? I mean, I, but I just want some um, pause. I want some... Uh, interregnum in terms of uh, you know what what the status of that work is at the moment of initial reception mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really interested in deferring that moment of recognition of something as a work of art but at the same time I recognize the necessity of uh, recognition eventually that what I made was a work of art because if if that recognition does not come then it's not interesting at all Right, so it's but, but I am interested in deferment, and then I'm interested in in um, you know rec, uh, recognition that it's a work of art. Yeah. yeah. So my Concordia colleague John Latour has a question: uh, Can you and other artists uh, have been key in shaping an identity for Vancouver as a hub of photo conceptual art in Canada? Do you think this still holds true for the city? And are there any any Vancouver-based photo artists that you follow today? I, I follow artists, but I don't follow according to a medium, right? I think there's lots of really good uh, Vancouver artists. I mean, uh, you know, Brian Youngen is a great, Van I mean, he doesn't live in Vancouver <laughs> anymore. Does that make him still a Vancouver artist? Uh, you know, Jeffrey Farmer. There's a lot of artists, uh, they use photography, and, um, right, so I'm interested in, uh, yeah, there's, I think there's lots of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, young artists uh, emerging, right? But I haven't lived in Vancouver for, um, you know, seven years, so I, I haven't really followed it uh, as intently as I, I used to, right? So... Uh, a question from Tong Shen, uh, who writes that, that uh, they're an emerging artist and they, they're interested in, in a track record, but uh, given the situation, shows are not happening. And, and do you have advice for emerging artists? You mean during the pandemic? Is that the, what the question is? Uh, in the pandemic, but I, but perhaps also generally. I'm sure there's, there would be many people who would like to... Well, to I, I say this even to my own students, right? And um, I always say that, yes, okay, you may have aspirations to be an artist and so on, right? And, uh, and that's fine. That is an artist who uh, can secure success within the art system, the art world, have a gallery and be a gallery artist and, and, and so on. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also think it's, uh, they should be open to um, all kinds of parallel or different tracks that involve a uh, high degree of creativity and innovative and critical thought. And they exist out there. And, they, and it's, not, it's not as though only the art system is the highest calling. I don't believe in that. That used to be a very kind of romantic notion of the art system. That, you know, that it was like the most kind of... Uh, uh, sacred refuge for an artist that and that if you didn't if you gave up on art then somehow that was a mark of failure right that extended in, in very gendered and sexist terms to women artists who would give up let's say uh art in order to raise a child right this is that was seen as like why, why would i mean i remember talking to collectors and they'd say i thought she was a better artist than that but you know she decided to be a mother and you know she's not serious I mean, it's unbelievable, right? <laughs> so I'm not making that stuff up. It's just, you know, it's horrible. And so, so there's lots of, um, lots of opportunities, I think, out there. I mean, maybe less so with the pandemic right now, but lots of different tracks. And I think you have to be prepared to, to at least explore them, right? I mean, I have students or some students, one student, for example, is incredibly good at uh, developing uh, with software, you know? And I'm thinking... You know, if I was you, I'd, I'd also explore that. And then, but she says to me, but then I'm afraid that if I did that, then I might get into a track and I would, it would take me away from, from art, right? And uh, I, I said, well, I'm just saying be open to it. And, and maybe that would be a way to bring you further down into art in a funny way, you know? So I, I think my advice is not to look at uh, these, you're, you're, the, what, you know, for, the first advice is look, explore 
think about all your all that you can do, the very strengths that you have, and then think about where those strengths can be uh, deployed and where that would lead, right? And then also think, uh, try not to think about how those various strengths that lead to various tracks uh, in any way exclusionary. That one track is so exclusionary from the other that's, that's, uh, that if you went down one track, then they, that neg uh, negates another track, right? So I think keep, keep things really open and also be very patient. Um, you know, that, you know, uh, the, and I say that <laughs> from experience, you know, being an artist is like a really, really long game. You know, I made furniture work for 40 years now. Now, finally, people are really interested in, right? And so I would say that's my advice, you know? Always have a sense of, what you, uh, of who you are, what you can do, and, um, and don't kind of, don't kind of over-determine um, notions of compromise. Mm -hmm. When I say compromise, I don't mean like ethical compromise. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying compromise like somehow... That's, you know, I brought, for example, I brought in uh, a leading uh, per design expert from, from Wayfair, right, into fine arts. And that, I, I got some flack for that, for that from some of the MFAs. Well, what, is, what is this? I don't want to work for Wayfair. I said, yeah, but maybe for some of you, it's, it's the right thing. You know, maybe it's a good, good thing to at least know what it's about. I wasn't trying to push it. Right. And uh, some MFA students were there and they really appreciate it. So, you know, that's why I'm saying. Just keep it, keep it open. No, I, th I think that's great advice. Thanks. Uh, Joanne Bernie Donsker has a question. She says, uh, hi, Kitty and Ken. Thank you for the tremendous discussion. Uh, Ken, you spoke of your early trips to China and your interest in the works of artists in China. How engaged today are you with artists and the cultural community in China? Uh, much less so since I've had kids. <laughs> And so on, but I also think it's it, that that moment, Joanne, has has kind of closed quite a bit under uh, the present regime. You know, we, there's a real uh, return to a kind of um, highly pious Maoist uh, authoritarian in Xi Jinping, and uh, that's totally quite closed. I would say even and last time I was there was two maybe two years ago, and um, the art scene was really. Uh, much less interesting, much less international in perspective. Of course, people can still travel and so on, um, but it was, uh, you know, even, even, the, uh, even the game of, uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping said, uh, you know, playing cat and mouse, which was a kind of allegory of how uh, the first gen and second generation of Chinese artists kind of played art, you know, uh, uh, this kind of doubling up of uh, language that was critical to China once they were, uh, in Europe or in America, or then critical of the West when they're in China, that doesn't th is not no longer possible today. I would say not not to the extent it was, and even the seven nine eight district is much much is a shallow of what it used to be in terms of the art district of Beijing. Um, Ken, another question that, that I've had. Uh, so when, when we were working on the book, uh, there were, there were some things, some, some texts that we found very easily, some things that you had in your inbox, the, the London art diaries, I think were maybe PDFs of old faxes. Um, and, and, but at the end of it, we had a, a, a substantive collection of, of about 30 years worth of work. And I'm wondering if at any point did you reflect on uh, when you would read your early pieces and think this is really good or this is really naive or this is really cocky versus uh, how later pieces maybe where your, your style had, had uh, changed or, or become differentiated and, and maybe how, how you saw yourself reflected in, in your own writing. Well, yeah, it was very vivid. It was kind of like, re it was kind of like revisit revisiting an earlier form of yourself uh, that's no longer you because I was an earlier form and um and yet you knew that was that person and that's a, and um and so it was very very vivid uh to kind of uh a lot of memories came back right even uh mundane memories uh of certain moments that uh, uh of my life at that point a whole range of things and uh it wasn't so much i was thinking this is really good as um as uh wow i was really in a zone it's like a real basketball tone i was really in a zone at this moment, wow, you know, and uh, 
I, 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 I was more, maybe it was more wistful because I would say to myself, I'd say to my wife, I was really in a zone, but geez, what happened? I'm totally out of the zone <laughs> now. I wish I could get back into the zone and so on. And uh, so it was more like that, you know. Thanks very much. Uh, there's, there's another comment from David Schaefer about the Furniture Works. Uh, leave that uh, for you to read in, in the comments. Uh, but he's, he's saying thank you for a great conversation today and, and he's looking forward to reading the book. Um, I don't know if there's any, any parting words that either Kitty you want to leave or Ken you want to leave or anything else that... that uh... I think there's uh, quite a few uh, friends I see on, on, uh, among the participants, Joanne being being one of them and you know I wrote uh, an essay for a show uh, that uh, really was uh, overseen by Joanne at the Museum mm -hmm. of in Munich when she was director and uh, uh, it was called a for a show called Shanghai Modern 1919 to 1945 and uh, I have a lot of memories <laughs> about uh, that trip it was kind of an amazing amazing uh, trip and thanks to Joanne and I also see uh, you know, others, uh, I see Gaetan from uh, Power uh, Plant, and I see, I always want to say PowerPoint, but uh, I, I see Alice Jim, uh, I knew her from Vancouver, and Abbas, who baked a really nice cake in um, effigy and, uh, of myself. She was actually a student <laughs> in my class. He was never a student in the sense that, <laughs> sense that I, he was always bright, right, brilliant, so I, I could never teach him anything, but he was always bright, so he was a student. And then Janey, <laughs> Uh, so Henry Lou, Joanne Sloan, great, uh, from uh, Concordia, and yeah, it's great to see so many, many, uh, Monica Gagnon, uh, Philip Monk, wow, okay, R Ricardo Ocaranza, remember that, Kitty, it, Ricardo, yeah, yeah, sure. a great photographer <laughs> from the Bath region, yes. uh, Fuller. I guess now I have to, now I'm obliged to name everybody on it, I'm a Donna, but that's, that's a given, okay, and uh, who else, I think there was like, uh, yeah, it's kind of a sort of. I mean, I'm not sorry if I miss anybody. <laughs> Cornelia Weingarten. Yeah, this is like a. Uh, this is your life. It's uh, it's, 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 Meredith Carruthers, come on, mom. She's downstairs. <laughs> okay. It's a list of the great and the good, obviously. So uh, uh, this is this has really been fantastic. I think uh, uh, Kitty, thank you very much for taking the time. Ken, again, thank you, thank you both. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, has been with us this afternoon. This has been a really, really enjoyable, uh, stimulating conversation. And, and again, my very sincere thanks to both of you for taking the time. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks, Kitty. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.